Fair Housing Friday of um, Fair Housing Month. So thank you for joining us. The Fair Housing uh, Friday series is something that we developed um, in 2020, go figure, when we had to move all of our programming quite suddenly online. And we found the Fair Housing Friday space to be a really good opportunity to um, invite um, discussions, more creative discussions around housing and, and um, kind of like dig into um, more niche topics, invite different voices to the table to think about how housing intersects with other parts of our lives and really just make it as a space where it's inviting for the community. So we've always um, really appreciated the, the kind of investment folks will have in the Q&A, but also in the opportunity that it gives us just to um, reimagine our housing space and how we talk about housing. Um, and so I'll just uh, start by introducing um, myself and the Fair Housing Project. Um, we, the Fair Housing Project is part of the Champlain Valley of Economic Opportunity, CVOEO. Uh, and I'm Corinne Yantz, I'm, I'll be the facilitator for today. And I'm joined by a really incredible set of panelists. Um, Will and Jennifer are joining us from uh, Juniper Creative. Uh, that is a, a public art um, uh, collective that has uh, made a really significant impact on our, our, um, our infrastructure here in Vermont, really changing the way that we engage with our public spaces. Uh, we have Megan Tedder from Evernorth, which is an affordable housing uh, finance agency, formerly Housing Vermont, but now it's, uh, uh, Evernorth is actually serving other parts of, of the um, Northeastern region. And then we have Sal uh, Millichamp, and Sal is a resident leader at uh, Champlain Housing Trust, uh, Lauren Ty Building, that's in the New North End. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with all these panelists in different capacities. And it's just, um, for me, I'm, I'm, it's a really amazing opportunity to bring these um, voices to the same table and think about um, resonant agency in the space that they're living in, how and why it's important for folks to have um, agency, to have an impact, to feel a choice in the, in the space that they're living in. Uh, and so before I start passing the mic and, and let us hear from our um, amazing voices that have joined us today, I'm going to do like a, a brief uh, Fair Housing Month spiel. Um, so if you're here today, you probably know that April is Fair Housing Month. We uh, celebrate um, the passing of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 every April here at um, CBOEO's Fair Housing Project. Um, and we do that through a variety of educational and creative events, um, including our Fair Housing Friday, uh, Friday series and um, a host of whole uh, other events from uh, the Heart and Home Project to our partnership with the libraries. Um, and there's events happening all across Vermont. So I'll do a little like at the end, I'll just highlight a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, of course, I've introduced um, Jennifer and Will from um, Juniper uh, Collective or Creative, uh, really incredible public artist, uh, Megan Tedder from Ever North and Sal from uh, Champlain Housing Trust, Lauren Tide. Um, and then just to say, um, you know, so every, the, the reason why we pass, uh, we celebrate the passing of the Fair Housing Act is it's important for us to take that time to recognize that we have certain protections uh, here in Vermont and across uh, the country due to the Fair Housing Act. So that is um, the Fair Housing Act has enshrined into law um, protections for our, um, um, for uh, the seven national protected classes, uh, including race and color of your skin. That's really the, the reason why the Fair Housing Act came into being, but it was expanded to include a country of national origin, religion, uh, sex, family status, dis and disability. Um, and yeah, and each state has the opportunity to kind of expand on the Fair Housing Act. Not all states do. There's different um, perspectives about um, the kind of pros and cons for, for adding more protected classes to the Fair Housing Act. Um, but here in Vermont, we have expanded on it to include gender identity, sexual orientation, 
marital status, receipt of public assistance. So uh, subsidies such as um, your housing choice voucher or Section 8 voucher. Um, age is protected here in Vermont and um, income of prospective uh, residents. That's kind of a complicated one that um, we can always have a longer conversation about. And then most recently victims of abuse, sexual assault and stalking. And while the housing month is a time to celebrate that these protections are enshrined in federal law, it's also a time to recognize that we have a long way to go to give everyone uh, equal access to safe, stable, and affordable homes. Uh, probably if you're on this call, you already know that Vermont has a really um, intense housing crisis. We have not enough homes for the people who live here. And, and really all across the country, different communities are grappling with their housing uh, shortage. And that's why it's important. Oh, and so what, what that means is that not everyone actually has equal opportunity in housing choice. So the purpose of the Fair Housing Act is not, it's not fulfilled. We, we still have work to, to do to get there. And knowing that um, not everyone has equal opportunity to housing choice, so they can't choose where they live, it's really important for us as um, advocates and makers and community members to think about ways that we can create more opportunities for choice in our neighborhoods, uh, especially for the folks living in affordable, uh, affordable or subsidized housing. Um, and so that brings us to why we're here today. Um, uh, I think it's, oh, we're going to start with Megan um, from Ever Evernorth. And uh, Megan, if you could just introduce yourself and, and your work too, just, um, I don't think by my really super brief introduction, totally did that uh, service, but um, you could do a better job. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'm just going to jump in sharing my screen and I'll give a little spiel about um my organization and my role there. Let's see. All right. So as Corinne mentioned, and actually first I wanna back up and just say thank you to CBOEO and Corinne and Jess for all the work you've done to organize these activities. I see it expand every year and I think it's really great. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel with everyone and talk about this important subject. Um, so Ever North, as Corinne mentioned, we are a affordable housing nonprofit. We used to be called Housing Vermont, but we recently merged with another organization. So we also work in New Hampshire and Maine. Um, today, I'm just going to focus on our work in Vermont. Um, we develop, invest, and co-own a bunch of properties here in Vermont. Actually, just looked it up, and it's over 3,000 households that we have put out there in the world and are occupied by residents, um, majority of which are making less than 60% area median income. So low to moderate income families. And my program is called the Connections Program. Um, it started in 2016 and it's kind of our arm that focuses on resident services and helping our partners deliver the, the highest quality resident services. Some of the types of projects um, our department's been working with real estate development on are new construction. Um, you can see in the center there, that's Sal's <laughs> home, Laurentide. That was a brand new building um, created in the new north end of Burlington. We also have um, renovations of buildings that we purchase that are kind of not well maintained. And over to the right, you can see New Avenue, which is in downtown St. Johnsbury. And then we also work on projects where we have co-owned a building for a while and it needs, needs a facelift. It needs an influx of resources. And so to the left there, you can see Tuttle Block um, and downtown Rutland that we are actually in the process in the next couple months, the residents will be able to move back into their newly freshly done apartment and community. Um, those projects tend to be challenging because we do have existing residents to relocate and try to make that process as smooth as possible. Um, so 
So that just give you a scope of what we are doing. And next, um, just an overview of what drew us to starting to engage residents throughout the design process and including their voices is from the developer perspective. Um, we saw examples of us investing in community spaces and them going unused. And to us, that's a failure. We didn't necessarily design it with our community in mind. And so we want to minimize cases of those. Also in those situations, sometimes it, it puts a burden on the property manager to invest in alterations to accommodate resident needs after the fact. And we'd really like to kind of avoid that. And then also like the example in Tuttle Walk, it helps to create like transparency when we engage the residents throughout the process and they, you know, gain community buy-in for this transition. And most importantly are the resident benefits. Um, I think when residents have engaged in these process or our process, um, they have realized just and gained confidence in their ability to contribute to the community as a whole. Um, I think they often feel valued and more seen when we take the time to slow down and hear from them about what they would like to see in their community. We've also seen tenants um, build relationships between each other during this engagement process, learning that they're sharing the same experience that they might not have um, otherwise been aware of. And then the ultimate outcome is having an influence on designs and programs that are in their community. And you can see to the right, just an example of like one of the ways that we've tried to create engaging activities for residents to give us feedback in different ways. This is obviously a list of pros and cons about the laundry room and things that we can do better, things that are going well. Um, and that helps us We kind of have a design standard document and it helps inform how we're going to design buildings or what we think is like the ideal best practice. So I want to give some background on how this has evolved at our organization. It started in 2019 with um, a couple post occupancy surveys. So we would send surveys out to residents who have lived in a new building for about a year. So at that one year mark, we kind of have a, people have an idea of what's working and what's not working. Um, and we were able to, at that time, if say a resident had a door that was mal malfunctioning, we could address it under a warranty period and really give them a chance to test everything out, but also address it in a timely way at that one year mark. The next year in 2021, we continued with those surveys and expanded upon them. And we included pre-rehab surveys. So that Tuttle Block example, really trying to give residents an opportunity to let us know what features aren't working in their apartment, what are their specific needs in their apartment and incorporating that in our conversations with architects and other designers. And then in 2022, we continued those surveys, but we added this focus group component. Um, I think we're all very excited and have seen really good feedback through this. Um, and we've done three focus groups, kind of the cases I mentioned at the beginning, those buildings. Um, and this year we've tried to advance it further by establishing a staff committee that's really dedicated to making this a standard process so that it's not just for projects where, you know, a certain developer likes this idea, but we really are trying to standardize it for all projects so that we really are designing with residents and not just for them. So I'm gonna give a couple examples of the focus groups and what we've learned and how we've kind of solicited information. So um, this is the Tuttle Block focus group. Um, I didn't include resonant photos because I did not have permission. I wanted to be respectful, but you can see we put posters around the room and we gave them post-it notes to indicate whether they use the space always, sometimes or never to give us an idea of what the priorities are. Um, and we went around and listed different ways you would use a community space. 
And so what some of the things we learned here is that residents always wanted to use a community space to print documents. We had no idea that so many people had like smartphones and devices, but no way to print, say, an application they needed to submit. And so we worked with property management to discuss where we would put that, what education we'd need, um, who would be responsible for keeping it supplied, those sorts of things. Um, and then one thing, another thing we learned was that people didn't want this community didn't want comfy furniture. They didn't want like sit and, you know, relax and binge movies. Like they were like, we don't want to walk into the community room and find someone like asleep on the couch. Like I want maybe a little bit more adaptable for, you know, private events and big meetings. Um, and so that was really helpful and definitely informed our design. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention a little bit earlier is that whenever we survey our residents or do a focus group, we want to, we prioritize like giving gift cards out and we ask like what kind of gift card would they want, like something local or something like a visa, just to make sure we're compensating residents for their time. Um, and then we also, with the focus groups, we'll always include, include food as an incentive as well, just to um, make sure that it's not just us pulling information from the community, but we're able to give back in ways. Um, we also work to set aside like a budget each time that we can use towards changes that we hear from them. Um, and then one other thing we do is at the end of each of these um, kind of strategies or activities, we meet with property management and we talk through how we can implement these changes or what changes we aren't able to. And we share all the feedback through distributing a letter to all residents in the community saying, this is what we heard. This is what we can work on. This is things that we're not able to address for X, Y reason. Um, and I think that's really helped build trust and like transparency that you know, there are going to be things that we aren't able to address, but we want to make sure we explain why that is or what barriers we're, um, we're facing. So this is um, a chart that was in one of those reports. Um, and you can see that we kind of weighted the scale and the top things that the Tuttle Block community wanted was a place to share a meal, hold private events and print documents. One resident said that they would like to use the room for a baby shower and that they had a really big family and they could picture all of them coming in. And so we made sure to pick out furniture that could be stored away, but also offer a lot of space for those sorts of things. Um, we also added a sink into the community room because if you're preparing meals, it's really essential to have that. And it wasn't originally in the design. And so we jumped right on that idea and switched it up to make sure that that was part of it. Um, this community also was really into art. They loved, they would set up a table in the hallway to do artistic cards and things like that. Um, and so we made sure to add like built-in cabinets so that they can store all their art supplies there and the sink will help with, you know, cleaning up those activities as well. So um, yeah, so that was our first one. We learned some really great information, but it is just a small group. And so we, we wanna continue to do this, recognizing that each community is gonna be unique in what they wanna see. So we're gonna keep going here. Um, here's an example of another activity kind of similar that we did at Laurentide, where we put a floor plan down. We kind of highlighted the spaces that we were curious about and asked a similar question of where, where do you, how often do you use this space? Is it always, do you sometimes use it? Are you never in this space? Um, and it kind of, you know, forces us to be a little bit more critical about things that we are standardizing, for example, bike storage. Um, only one person said that they always use it. And it's something that I think in general, we we set as a standard in all our buildings. I know Laurentide had three bike storage areas. So something that 
we learned through that process. Um, we also learned that access to the community room wasn't always clearly communicated. So we created a document posted outside the door to really instruct people about how to access it, what opportunities, what resources were in there, supplies. Um, and we also heard some feedback about the package room. Um, there were dollies in there, but I guess not enough to really meet the need of that community. Um, some people would use them to bring all their groceries up to their, their unit and forget it there. And so we just um, spent a little bit more money adding some more dollies to that package room for them as well. And there were some other changes that were coming down the pipe but had some barriers to them. This is another example of a graph that we shared with all the residents kind of giving an overview of the feedback, the spaces that, you know, for us that we need to focus more on. Um, the laundry room, the trash area, and the package room were the top three. Um, so we took that as we need to be really intentional about those designs. People spend a lot of time in it. And maybe we need to ask even more questions of how that's working or not working for residents. And one resident had a really, really good point. Um, they said that in this building, there were two and three bedroom units, and those were designed with laundry hookups with the assumption that the common laundry rooms would only be serving those smaller units. Um, but in practice, that's not the case. And so there was way more people using the laundry that was there than we anticipated. Um, and so it's something that we're going to look deeper at this year to evaluate how, how we come up with that number. And is it really fitting the needs of our community? And this is one of my favorite examples of a failure. <laughs> um, so this is New Avenue and St. Johnsbury, and we had probably 11 residents at this community meeting, and they have a really, really beautiful community room. And um, sorry about my, my messages here. And no one was using it. I think only one person mentioned that they were using this space. And if you can notice here, we have some bar stools, a really nice kitchen. But what we heard is these bar stools are too tall. People couldn't even sit on these bar stools. So someone up, up in the process thought it was a really like nicely designed, picturesque kind of style here, but it wasn't functional for the residents. And so that was something we could easily address and fix. Um, and then another thing is we, they had this beautiful kitchen but there weren't any dishes or pots or anything you would need to host a meal. And so we jumped on that as well, ordering a bunch of stuff to supply the kitchen. And actually one thing that came out of that is they have an AmeriCorps who's now gonna do a cooking class and offer it to residents as a result of that. Oops. All right. And so this is one of those graphs too that came out of New Avenue when we asked what the benefits and challenges were. And you can see that, I am so sorry, I have another training that I'm supposed to be in. Um, but the top challenges is they wanted to be able to like watch a basketball game together in the room. And there wasn't any kind of TV that they could share and have a movie night or anything like that. And they really desired that. So that was one of the main things that they told us. And so we added a smart TV to that space as well. The bar stools, as I mentioned, were mentioned tons of times. And then the lack of table space. They actually had two community spaces, big furniture, but like no end tables, no coffee tables to really do much on it. So if we looked at that, and we also are addressing that with getting kind of flexible furniture that they could pull in when they want to do like a big meal in those spaces. 
Um, and I think this last quote really sums up like why we do this is one of the residents there said, I'm really glad you guys did this because these are really beautiful rooms and they're not being used. Um, so that's our end goal is really to hope that um, by engaging residents, sharing this decision-making that there's benefits on both sides and we can do a better job at building and creating communities that really serve um, the people who are living in it. Um, so yeah. And that was that was all I had. I might have run through my time, but um, thanks so yeah. much, Megan. Yeah, it's funny. I'm I like as soon as I pass the mic, I'm like, thank God, it's not me anymore. <laughs> like that, like at beginning of like, oh, like I'm from like going through my script, but um, that was really helpful. I I um I I think those specific examples are just really important for us to be thinking about and the assumptions that um, we don't even know we have when we're when we're providing housing. And um, thinking about um, Will and Jennifer, like a much different like entry to thinking thinking about agency and and shared spaces. Um, it's funny. So my background was a as a resident organizer before I worked for the Fair Housing Project, and I think about how when I was um, organizing resident meetings, it was really hard to get people to show up. But I've been at uh, the the wall with Jennifer and Will, and I've seen people show up who like even if you're just kind of like, um, you know, painting. It's not like a formal community day. Like. People want to ask questions and get involved. Um, and and um, just as a quick for folks not familiar with Juniper Creative's work, you really have to look it up. As soon as you see it, you'll know that um, it's, it's part of the fabric of our lives here. Um, and most recently, y'all uh, finished a mural at the YMCA, which I'm really excited to see in person. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about um, from your lens how uh, public art and engaging community in public art creates a sense of agency in space. You go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> we talk about this at home all the time. So it's, 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 um, it's uh, you know, it's something that is very close to the, the mission of what we do is to get people involved, you know, and, and we, we like to, you know, cultivate just an atmosphere of fun. You know, creating art should be an enjoyable experience. Mm -hmm. And during that process, things do get intense, you know, especially um, from the social justice lens that we reflect. But um, you want to add on, Jennifer? Yeah, no, I mean, it's spot on. Yeah. The reason why we chose to focus on community murals is because I have a background in using creative expression to um, help college students mm -hmm. find a sense of belonging on, especially um, students who come from marginalized backgrounds in predominantly white institutions. And so giving them agency in finding their voices, developing their identities as college students and doing that through creative expression was important to their persistence in their college experience and getting to graduation. And so bringing that, that work into the work that we do in Community Murals was seamless for me. And Will came to Vermont um, from doing community-based work in public art and beautifying um, blighted communities and you know neighborhoods that have been you know fallen um yeah. into this disrepair because of landlords not taking care of of their residents taking care of the properties and and being able to give put a paintbrush in a community member's hand and say you know what come join us participate in this help us tell the story has been at the heart of all yeah. of the work we've done here in Vermont and just to add on to that, prior to moving to Vermont, I was the founder and ED of a grassroots nonprofit called SAGE Coalition. And SAGE stood for Styles Advanced and Graffiti's Evolution. 
So we would, I will organize graffiti, street artists, and just community members. We will go into, we were going to neighborhoods that were, I would say 50% abandoned. So these buildings were just eyesores owned by slumlords. And over the course of three days, we will organize artists, kids, community members, whoever was out there to paint every abandoned building. And we would cover the entire city block in the course of three days. And that event went on throughout the city of Trent for five years. That work is what got the attention of my niece, who was one of Jennifer's students, got me to Vermont, the rest <laughs> is history. But what we would do was very controversial, controversial work. You know, this was prior to like social media the way it is now. So a lot of the stuff that we were doing was flyers, um, just going to different places, telling people what we were doing. It was very, very boots to the ground. And, you know, most of the time, you know, the permission was very uneven. So we would have, you know, I, basically I would get permission from the people that live there, so more so than the, the slum lords who own these buildings. And the last event I did like that was in 2016. I remember one of the slum lords actually came out. We're painting this giant mural on the side of the building. And she was like, you have to remove that mural. I was like, well, the people in this community who's been living with this building for decades, there's a tree growing inside of it, for God's sake. No one's doing anything with the building. You know, there's crack vials everywhere. Like you're obviously not upkeeping this property. So and you're coming at me for painting a mural with the community, we cleaned up an abandoned lot, which was full of trash. You know, this whole block was just disgusting. And we cleaned it up in the course of a week. And she was coming at me and said, she, well, I'm going to get the police involved. The cops actually came out and had my side because that, by that point, I had already developed a reputation for just going around doing this, you know. And then we even got even deeper. We, we researched the building that she was complaining about and found out that she was 10 grand in back taxes, you know. So needless to say, it's been that was almost 10 years ago. That mural's still up to this day, right? So it's just about having the, you know, the gall to go out there and like, you know what? I'm tired of looking at this. I'm tired of having these eyesores in my neighborhood and it's not difficult to get a little bit of paint a few brushes and put some music on to have a party and that's really how it started it was that simple it was like yo let's compile our resources none of us really have money you know we're all living in these areas but it doesn't have to look like this you know just taking advantage of the opportunity to do something regardless of who may complain because at the end of the day we're just slapping paint on walls you know we're not hurting anyone you know, we may be bruising some egos, you know, and bruising some sensibilities, but at the end of the day, what's the, what's, what's the outcome if, it's, if nothing is done? Like, what's the, what's the outcome if we don't take a chance, if we don't take the risk and making something better than what it was or leaving a place better than what you came into it? And we're getting people who've never painted to participate. That work has evolved into the work we do with Juniper Creative because most of the people who come to our events don't have an arts background. And, and the one thing we consistently get is like, oh, well, what if we mess it up? It's like, well, you can't, you know, because at the end of the day, we're going to figure it out together. We're going to, we're going to show you basic techniques that you can teach anyone. And you'll be surprised at what you can do if you just take a chance. We're, you're not graded. You know, this is not something that you're going to be judged upon because we have enough experience to make sure that it looks good no matter where it's placed. You know, and it's just, it's just that simple. How can we use arts to have fun and say something? You know, education doesn't have to be boring. doesn't have to be tedious, you know? So you'd be surprised at how much people will share with you when you actually create a space that they could be comfortable and express themselves. And part of our creative process in Community Murals involves allowing people to have agency, individuals have agency in creating their individual pieces of artwork yeah. that we collage into the mural and it becomes part of a collective whole composition. Yeah. And and most of you have seen this work around Burlington. They look like mosaics on walls, but they're individual pieces of artwork making up one, one big image. Yeah. And, and that's where people have the most fun, you know, that's where they're willing to take the most risk. And, you know, philosophically, community murals are about having, helping a community tell their story, helping a community take agency and accountability over what they're contributing to. Yeah. So even though we're creating these, you know, these works of art, in areas that we are not residents of because we leave 
including community members in that creative process means they then take ownership of the artwork and tell the story they'll tell the story they'll protect the art they'll defend the art and and that's even more powerful than what we've done you know we came in and we facilitated the process but then we turned over the final product into that community. We tell people, I'm sorry to jump in, but you just reminded me of something. Um, <laughs> now we tell people all the time, it's like, we're coming in more like as coaches, mm -hmm. you know, and we also like to play, you know? So it's like, but we have enough experience to make sure that the end result is something that's refined and that clearly states exactly what our intentions are. You know, people, people are going to see these public works and they're going to develop their own narrative, you know? Um, and people are always going to see something that we don't see. They're going to have their own relationship with it, right? But the story is just as important as the final outcome. So when we tell people like, yo, this is how it started. This is where we come from. And these are our intentions. And we're opening it up for a conversation to help facilitate the, the concept of what's going to be created. So we're, you have to be fluid in this work, you know? So it's like, we're coming in, but we're, we're, we're able to zigzag through different mm -hmm. obstacles, different conversations, different levels of intensity, because we're experienced and all that we started the way we started this work you know prior to us coming together we had to jump through just as many hurdles jennifer was in a higher air room i was in a grassroots urban area and each one comes with its own set of obstacles and we've been successful in those worlds so when we when we started juniper creative we had already had a very high level of confidence in exactly what we wanted to put out into the world and people see that you know and people and people are attracted to that you know, because we are leaders in that mm -hmm. in that respect. So we have to be willing to make sure that the people who we have involved in these projects have a sense of comfort to know that we're not going to take them in the direction that is something that they can't figure out, mm -hmm. you know. And we've had several times where people have come up to us and expressed their disdain for what we're doing because of either the subject matter of our work or the fact that um, they feel that they're not involved. And it's like, yo, well, there's a paintbrush, there's a bucket, get to work. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, at the end of the day, you still have to show up. You can't come at the end and tell like, well, we we didn't know, well, that's not our problem because we've been very public. You know, our, our work gets a tremendous amount of press. Most of the time that people have come up to us is literally because of the race the race of the figures in our walls. It's very, it, it's very black and white with the people who have given us negative feedback. And we've had several occasions where it, it was very tense, you know, like our backs are turned 90% of the time. So we don't know what can happen to us, but we're very confident in the fact that, you know, we believe in what we're doing and we're willing to take the risk. It's not easy work. It's mm -hmm. very, it could be very dangerous at times, especially at the peak of the pandemic and the racial uprisings, mm -hmm. you know? Not too many people in this state look like us or do what we do, mm -hmm. you know? Especially from the uh, of, um, a place of uh, social justice. So we have to take all that into consideration anytime we sign up to do a project to the fact that we have to make sure that we're protected and that we have enough confidence to make sure we see it through because these aren't projects that we just go in and do in a few days. Each project takes at least a, a month or more. You know, we move into these neighborhoods. Like Jennifer said, we're not from most of these communities that we're serving. So we expect there to but be- we set up shop there. We we're set up like, shop there and we, yeah. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're, you know, contributing to the economy because yeah. we're shopping in the grocery stores yeah. or patronizing every local community. restaurants. Yeah. You know, we're getting to know the people who in the area, you know, and when, when Megan was talking about participatory design, I didn't have that language before not realizing that some of the, you know, I built an entire multicultural center at an elite private white, predominantly white in college here in Vermont by bringing students to the table saying they gave us this building let's go yeah. like what do you want to see here putting papers up around the entire building every room what would should be in this room what should happen and within a year later I implemented everything that those students wanted and to this day everything that was created still exists yeah and I'm not there anymore. But also, too, <laughs> once we started doing murals at her center, yeah. 
we just recently found out that the students now initiate their own projects. Yeah. Where that culture had never existed yeah. prior to what Jennifer had created there. So we see the so. community murals as part of creating self, you know, a sense of belonging, creative expression. Um, when Will came to Vermont, at started at the center, which was his niece was part of the collective of students that worked with me in creating, you know, the, the, the bare bones of the center initially. And they had this, uh, this envision, like, we need to have murals in this place. We're like, great, hold on. We know exactly who we're going to bring in to, to like help usher this in for us. And, and because, you know, we're in rural Vermont, most of the students of color were coming from urban centers. Yeah. So having murals was normal for their everyday, like that. yeah, right. for their everyday lives, you know, walking into this building and feeling like they were walking into, you know, someplace in Brooklyn or the Bronx, you know, or Harlem, where right. I'm from. And it was, or, you know, even some of them going to Montreal and saying, oh my God, we look what's there and look at what we have here in this place. Yeah. So that was really important to helping folks establish, you know, feeling like they had a place somewhere, you know, that placemaking is so important in, in everything. You know, so many people are making decisions I mean, we see it all the time, you know, politicians are making decisions for the people, but yet none of none of those um, initiatives actually are benefiting the people that they claim they are for, right? Like we see that all the time with institutions that operate on these hierarchies. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that like really sticks with me with what you said is the one thing um, I'm, I'm like, we need to have this be like a whole long series of conversations. But that moment of it's not just engaging people, it's engaging the people that are like othered or silenced. I don't feel comfortable in that space and really saying like, this is your space. Like, how do we give agency to you? How do we allow you to have an impact? And I think that's something really important when we're talking about affordable housing and subsidized housing because the reality is that we don't if you need a housing subsidy you you already have a limit to where you can choose to live and so how do we say like if you don't have a lot of choice in where you live how do we give you space to feel like you still belong that you still have choice and agency um, and I'm like, uh, if, hear from Sal uh, real quick too, before we open it up for our questions. Um, and because Sal lives in affordable housing, um, not that it's so different from other kinds of apartments, but I do know that Sal um, has been a, a significant leader in her building, um, thinking about um, bringing in art, bringing in gardens, bringing in parks and rec. How do we give space uh, for what the residents need? How do we give space for what the kids need? That's a big thing that comes up. Anyway, so I'll just pass the mic to you, Sal. All right, thanks a lot, Corinne. And thank you, Megan, and thank you, Will and Jennifer. I, I love everything that you all are saying, and um, I keep thinking about listening. We have to listen to the people, who what they want, and. Um, then we can move on from there. And I think that's what all of you have said. Um, I moved into Lauren Tide. My husband, Bernie, and I moved in uh, as soon as it opened. And it was so exciting to see so many different people. We live in a diverse community in Lauren Tide. Uh, it's wonderful. Lots of languages. Um, I'd say we're finally getting to connect again. Uh, in the beginning, Corinne came with some other artists and we were doing art and we were doing um, potlucks, but then COVID happened and uh, then it was, it was pretty bad. Um, everybody felt shut down. Can we talk? You know, somebody's not wearing a mask or somebody is wearing a mask. Um, a lot of challenges and a lot of COVID. Um, 
but the connections are strong and um, my background is social work. I'm retired. I do this because I love it. I want to connect with my neighbors. I want to know who they are. I want them to know who I am. We can just say hi in the hallways, but for us to connect and talk about what our concerns are or what our joys are. Um, I started a coffee hour to a couple hours every Thursday. So, um, you know, we're living in affordable housing. We need affordable housing. Um, so we decided we would ask Panera. If you all don't know it, if you call Panera, they'll give away their leftovers. So every Wednesday night we go and get the leftovers and sometimes they'll give you up to four boxes. We're always hoping for just two. And um, lay out all the food on Thursday morning and uh, have coffee. And whoever shows up, shows up. And we're trying to get the other buildings to come over too. Because we're going to have so many buildings here. We need to be heard. We need to know what the concerns are as early as possible. Um, it's kind of... A hangout time. For me, I look forward to Thursdays because I can sit still because I do other things like teach swim classes. And it was so exciting to see that mural that Jennifer and Will were working on. I remember stopping and, and saying something to you, Jennifer, and you turned around and you were up on this high thing painting. It was such a beautiful mural. But anyway, back to Laurentine. Um, so there's projects with the park next door. Um, we'll connect with them. And, you know, when we all moved in, there's large families, large families. A lot of them are from Somalia. And um, it's kind of like how we, you know, big families are. Take your, take your brothers and sisters and go play. And I've got a lot of things to do. Of course they do. They have big families. And so the playground is um, a wild time. But, uh, and so with people who um, are not kid focused, there's grumbling there. So to get to people to know the children, the children to know them. Um, I always feel like once you know a person's name, there's a, there's a connection. And uh, just hanging out at the playground is a nice place to be. Um, the big thing that I've done recently is I felt kind of, you know, the older kids didn't really have much to do. They've got these climbing things for smaller kids and then the big kids start throwing the ball and it gets really wild. But in the winter, it's, um, there's not much. So I really wanted a ping pong table and uh, Champlain Housing Trust has a dinner, which is amazing. They have a dinner in the winter time and I was going in to look for the bankers because I figured I'd get a, uh, a ping pong table. But CHT, when they heard what I was looking for, the bankers to buy a ping pong table, they said, we'll get you one. So um, now the older kids, they're usually in their like fourth grade up, we meet and um, they're getting better soon. I bet they'll be able to beat me, but that's kind of the goal right now is for them to beat me in ping pong. And we haven't really got a good schedule yet. We haven't had it uh, too long, but um, just to have those interactions and um, art's always good. We have a really great sash worker, um, which means support, services at home and it's supposed to be for older folks who are on medicaid but the person we have eilish she will try and help anyone so uh she's a wonderful person that will come and do jewelry once a week or um have bingo and if somebody else wants to come in she's very welcoming um so we have we're getting gaining more activities again um and connecting with each other and stopping and talking in the hallways about the struggles. We have had a lot of struggles in um, uh, COVID. During that time, the, um, we have apartments that are set up for people coming out of homelessness. And uh, some of the struggles are hard. The addictions are still going on and bringing in people who 
are not ready and a lot of um, that was that was a really, really hard time. But um, we all rallied together and uh, when we weren't feeling heard, we somehow were able to get the community room and we did keep it to the small amount of um, I told them we just needed a meeting. We were having a, a few people, but we just kept it to a few people and then they had to leave. So we worked on an email saying all of the things that we were concerned about. And then I would write it down and tell the person what I'd written down. And if that was correct, then they were okay with that. And then they had to leave and another, you know, other people came in because of COVID could only have a small number. But then the email was sent out and um, Champlain Housing Trust got back with her and us. And then we all worked together to feel heard. That was the main thing to feel heard. I'm not sure everything got fixed right away, but to feel heard and know that they're working towards um, getting things better. What COVID did do, which was a plus, was the rental assistance. The rental assistance where people were struggling so much financially. And we had uh, food coming in from the restaurants that we would pass out and laundry. Laundry was is often an issue uh, when the um, washing machines break down and then, uh, or else we'd have to pay a, you know, a quarter where, you know, big buildings, nobody pays any money and people are struggling to find quarters or beating on your door saying, do you have a quarter? <laughs> I, you know, and you need it a dollar 25, I think. So I'm glad what has turned out is we don't have to pay for laundry. That's, that is a huge plus. It's just, um, it, you know, it's just a relief because people don't have a dollar 25 sometimes. They don't have that many quarters. And uh, anyway, I feel like um, I'm so grateful that I live at Laurentide. Uh, we're getting more and more connected. And uh, I am grateful that Corinne came in the beginning with the artist and worked to get us all together. And it continues. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Sal. And something that you said um, that really struck me was that moment of if you know someone's name, it just changes things. And it's, it's amazing how many conflicts uh, kind of can just fizzle out. If you like, you know, the kid, like, hey, like yeah. we talked about this and they respond, right? And I do think about all the time, like, like, um, Sal, you do a lot of labor in your community and it takes time and not, and it takes, um, you know, a, a certain about way of thinking, a certain way of organizing um, that not everyone has, especially in subsidized communities where people are really like spread very thin. And so how do we like make space in communities for folks that might not have a cell in the building? Um, in our last two minutes, I know that I said like a big q and I, if you have a question, please email it to us. Uh, feel free to stick it in the chat. I do just want to hear like final thoughts from each of our panelists because um, so much was shared and I want, I want to have that moment where we just like land on, on the final, like the thing you want to say. Um, does that sound good for our panelists who are just being put on the spot? Uh, Megan, do you want to start or do you want to be like second? I can start. Um, I think what comes to mind in all of this is like, the idea of honoring people's experience and recognizing them as experts. Um, I think that's a social worky thing, but I think that is very clearly a theme I hear through all of it is, you know, in the murals, we work with community members and like they're really driving it. And the same with our work, we want our residents to be driving what changes and what we develop. Um, and I think Sal does the same with her neighbors, really honoring them, recognizing them and helping to um, empower, empower their voices on another level. So yeah, I think that's my reflection. Thanks, Megan. How about Jennifer and Will? Rock, paper, scissors, you each can have half a sentence. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, one of the things that came to me, especially when Sal was speaking, was, you know, the 
the exhaustion that can come from organizing, mm-hmm. you know? And Jennifer and I had to take stock of our energetic level at the end of last year. And we went into this year at a more of a steady pace instead of a rabbit one as we've been going at the past couple of years because it was starting to take a toll on our health you know physically and mentally it's you know we we were literally we were having this conversation about a month ago or so where we were talking to a client where we were like well we've only been home a couple months in the past two years you know because we're out in the world doing this work and we didn't realize how much of a toll it was taking on us and our our family and our home because we were giving so much of ourselves and we weren't recharging our own battery Mm -hmm. you know and this work is very time consuming you know, one of the things that that happened with COVID, you know, um, was, of course, it was a tough time, right, for across the board. But one of the things that Jennifer and I realized is that we had also a gift of time to do this work at a time where it was more needed than at a, any time in our life, you know. But in doing and using that time to do this work and seed our our you know our ideology, our methods, our business we we were taking so much from ourselves and weren't recharging our own well you know so just having um just finding that balance and doing the work and also making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and I just want to take a quick second to actually respond to Haley's question in the chat um (laughs) yeah it's there uh so Usually who initiates those projects, Haley, are the organizations that bring us in, into those communities. Um, We've really like, the way our process has challenged in, in, and has challenged the typical, uh, the typical um, public art process around uh, community engagement, when, when, what we tried to explain earlier was, you know, when you hear us talk about like this community engagement, community murals, this stuff is happening in real time. We don't typically, it's, it's a rare occasion that we already show up with a design in hand. Very rare. Um, and most are like request, request, request for proposals for public art requires you to have a design already in hand that a committee has chosen that is quote unquote, a representative body of that community. Um, And most of those people are making those decisions really about their own personal taste, right? And so, um, and then the the community engagement becomes an afterthought in in that creative process. And so we don't apply for RFPs. Right. So people, if they they know what we what we offer, they know what we have to deliver. They they like our aesthetic and they believe in our mission. So they just source us directly. And we are brainstorming with community, coming up with a design. All this is happening real time. People are surprised how quickly like we can come up with a design after a three hour, you know, visioning workshop. And we're like ready to go. Okay outline on the wall and you know workshops community paint days like all this is happening yeah. in in such a a fast pace so and one of the hardest things is picking the colors because <laughs> people ask us like, oh what 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 colors are we going to use we're like we're going to find out because we haven't we want to design the mural in conjunction with the community yeah. so we typically use just the the colors that are rainbow because it's like we have every color because we typically that's the, always the hardest part because it's you know, done on the spot, you know, there isn't any type of, um, like Jennifer said, we don't come in with a already fabricated idea. It's like, hey, we have a conversation where we're going to take this. Mm -hmm. And also too, especially when we're working with young people, letting them know that whatever we do come up with, they have to be brave enough to defend, Mm -hmm. you know, because Mm -hmm. you can't please everyone. That's the sure way of failing at anything where you're trying to please everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you want to say? What's your truth? How can we illustrate and paint that on the wall together? And we 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 work on sh- strengths based, right? Yeah. So if someone's, we're gonna always tap into where people want to shine, and and 
offer opportunities for people to take risks as well. That's right. Yeah, man, that like the moment of, of the assumptions that like when, oh, here's my my equal, equitable design, you know, and that's something that I think that uh, we can all, we all are familiar with uh, in all the different realms of work that we do. Um, so that's a really good um, thing to kind of put your finger on. Okay, and then Sal, uh, any last thoughts? Well, I just want to say I saw it happening with Will and Jennifer. It was great. I would see them with that paper down and working on it. It was really fabulous and it's uh, amazing. And I guess the same thing that you said that I said before, that connection. Um, we, once you know somebody's name and you've passed them in the hall a few times and had a few words or understand that everybody's going through something and mm -hmm. you can be a neighbor. It can be a neighbor and we can connect and be supportive to each other. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, I don't have to fix your problem, but I am your neighbor and I can listen. I might have a dollar twenty-five for the lunch. <laughs> I you know, I, I was like, it's just nice that they feel comfortable, you know, like that there is that like repertoire, that there's that community. It's like asking for the sugar, you know? Um, it's, I think that's, that's something really special. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you so much to our panelists. I mean, this I knew it would be an incredible conversation. I feel like we could do this like every week and still have more to say. And honestly, like I cannot express enough how kind of amazing it is to have like these three really different lenses that are all talking about the same thing, which is like community connection, community agency, get the voices in the room who like don't have space and give them space, right? Give people choice. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this Fair Housing Friday. Uh, thank you everyone for staying on the call um, and forgiving us for going over. Um, and, you know, stay tuned. I'll be sending an email with kind of um, some links from this conversation, um, some links from um, some of the projects that people have referenced, um, some notes from um, what we've talked about. Uh, and there's also um, another Fair Housing Friday coming up next week. So please feel free to join us then. Um, and always, you know, stick with us. Let's keep talking about housing and let's keep thinking out of the box and, and thinking about how we can um, make our communities more centered around the people that live there, right? For every, not just the select few that have the, like the big ideas that are, you know, maybe the, the chair that's too close to the countertop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope to keep seeing you around. And again, a big round of applause for our uh, panelists.